Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's program. Uh, my name is Glenn Deason, and with me is my colleague, uh, the great Alexander Mercuris. And our guest today is none other than Noam Chomsky. Um, it almost feels a bit redundant to introduce him, as everyone already should know who he is. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Chomsky has written more than 150 books on topics ranging from linguistics to media, propaganda and politics. Uh, Professor Chomsky is also referred to as the father of modern linguistics in terms of how language is used in politics to create uh, manipulation and also uh, to manufacture consent. Um, again, and this is a very important topic of the day, as we're now having, um, well, it's hard to remember uh, any recent history where we had more conformity, I would say, and groupthink in Western media than we have today over uh, our proxy war with Russia. Uh, so I guess, yeah, my, my first question uh, to Professor Chomsky would be, uh, how do you read Russia's uh, security interests uh, in order to understand Russia's policies? Uh, what is Russia doing? And well, what is motivating Russia? Russia's security interests are well understood. They've really don't have to ask me. You can ask the whole top echelon of the U.S. diplomatic corps for the last 30 years uh, since uh, the mid 90s when uh, Clinton abandoned uh, President Bush's promise to Gorbachev not to move NATO to the east. Uh, the leading figures in the diplomatic corps and the policy sciences have been pointing out uh, repeatedly that and uh, energetically that uh, this very seriously threatens Russian security interests. And particularly uh, if it moves to what every Russian leader has, from Gorbachev and Yeltsin up till today has identified as uh, unbreakable red lines, Georgia and Ukraine, for pretty obvious reasons. If you look at a map and you look at history, uh, they were willing to tolerate uh, incorporation of the Baltic states, the Visegrad states, but not Ukraine and Georgia. It's been made clear by Reagan's ambassador, Jack Matlock, uh, George W. Bush's hawkish secretary of state, Robert Gates, uh, current uh, uh, head of the CIA, William Burns, another Russia specialist, and a whole stream of them have been pointing out that this is reckless, provocative. It's uh, breaking into essential security interests of the United States of Russia. And the same is true of the dismantling of the uh, arms control agreements started by George W. Bush and extended by Trump, uh, which uh, all of which severely threatened Russia has been pointed out. That means placing uh, weapons uh, on Russia's border, which either are or can easily be converted to offensive weapons. Uh, the ABM Treaty, which George W. Bush dismantled, enabled the United States to place close to the Russian border facilities that can easily be, uh, they're called defensive, but they can easily be uh, modified to include offensive weapons aimed at the Russian heartland. Uh, Trump's dismantling of the Reagan-Gorbachev INF Treaty means that short-range missiles can be placed on the Russian border with a few minutes flight time to Moscow. Um, it's all pretty obvious. Nobody really has any doubts about it. So the security interests are quite plain. And of course, if you look at it from the Russian point of view, which, which makes sense, 
you can hate them and despise them or whatever you like. But if you want to understand them, have to look at their point of view. For German leopard tanks to be placed in Ukraine awakens some memories. It wasn't that long ago that German forces going through Ukraine to an open plain right up to Moscow and what was then Leningrad practically destroyed Russia. And it wasn't the first time. It was actually the third time in the century, counting the uh, Western intervention after 1918. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to, you can't really compare it with the United States because the United States has been immense, overwhelmingly secure. It's never had any threats. But if you can imagine uh, a Chinese uh, organized uh, aggressive military alliance uh, bringing uh, Mexico into it and placing advanced weapons on the US-Mexican border aimed at the United States. That's without any history of Mexico being the path to destroy the United States. But Mexico would simply be blown away if that happened. And uh, well, I think one of the main things that have characterized this war is how uh, it's continuing to escalate. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I remember the Germans sending a few helmets. And now, of course, we have German tanks being sent to kill Russians. Uh, but of course, also on the American side, there's been um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, escalation, and uh, we're now sending unprecedented amount of weapons. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, with this continued escalation and neither side ready to step back uh, uh, in this conflict between NATO and Russia over Ukraine, uh, are we heading towards a nuclear war? Uh, is is this likely? Can it be avoided? Uh, how how do you read the situation? If we're, if there's any possibility that we're heading towards a nuclear war, we might as well just say goodbye. It was nice knowing you. A nuclear war, there's a lot of loose talk about it, uh, depressingly. Uh, any person who has any understanding of the uh, conditions for nuclear conflict, certainly any strategic analyst, knows that there's no such thing as a limited nuclear war between major powers. Uh, you can move right up the escalation ladder to essentially termination. So talk about a possible nuclear war is uh, extremely dangerous. And it notice that almost all the talk is coming from the West. Uh, Russia saying almost nothing about it. Uh, occasionally a Russian repeats standard nuclear policy of all states, all states say that if our existence is threatened, we'll resort to the ultimate weapons. That's everybody's policy. Actually, the US goes beyond that and uh, says that preemption is possible. But uh, the, uh, so far, I should say that the Biden administration, probably under Pentagon influence, has been trying to limit the escalation by keeping weapons uh, as much as possible uh, towards defense rather than expansion. Uh, Zelensky wants much more expansive weapons. Just yesterday he, in the British Parliament, he called for fighter planes, uh, which uh, fighter planes would enable Ukraine to attack Russian territory. And uh, the people who are talking about this and advocating it in the United States too, he got noticed thunderous applause in the British Parliament when he called for sending, asking for British fighter planes to be sent, which is technically rather difficult since you have to train pilots and so on and so forth. But the thunderous applause says, let's try a gamble with the fate of, fate of Ukraine and the fate of the world. The gamble will be that if Ukraine is able to 
defeat Russia, as they're calling for, uh, Putin will quietly pack his bags and slink away and defeat and will not resort to the weapons that, of course, he has to uh, prevent this from happening. It's an incredible gamble with the fate of Ukrainians, who are the worst, who are being hit the hardest by these policies, uh, but also with the fate of the world. Uh, so, so far, as I said, there is, for, uh, luckily, one peacekeeping element in the US government, it's called the Pentagon, and they've been putting their limits on uh, how uh, advanced weapons can be sent, but they're under a lot of political pressure, may not be able to hold out. If so, the gamble will play its way out. Can I, can I ask Professor Chomsky, why is the, the willingness to take these gambles? I mean, why is it so important now for the United States to take these extraordinary risks that you're talking about. I mean, the idea of the Pentagon acting as a force of restraint is astonishing. Well, the Pentagon has been the dovish component of the US uh, p political military system. The Pentagon's putting bounds on what the Congress and uh, the neocons around Biden want to do. Uh, this has been very clear. Uh, it was recently made even more clear when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Milley, a couple of weeks ago, uh, suggested that uh, it's time for the war to be ended before it gets worse. We must move to some form of diplomatic negotiated settlement. That's the chairman of the joint chair of the Joint Chiefs. If anyone in the civilian uh, sector says that, they get vilified and demonized. So uh, Cong the Progressive Caucus in Congress uh, proposed a very mild resolution. It was so mild as to be embarrassing, suggesting that maybe we should think about diplomacy. Within one day, the attacks were so vicious uh, that they had to withdraw it. Uh, even Henry Kissinger, not known as a dove exactly, even he gets demonized and vilified if he dares to say what the almost the entire world is calling for. Uh, let's move towards diplomacy and negotiations instead of escalating the horrors. But when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says it, he's immune. And kind of interestingly, in the main establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, there have been articles by uh, highly respected uh, uh, civilian uh, uh, policy experts calling for uh, some moving towards uh, diplomacy and negotiations. And they get away with it there. But if anyone outside those a narrow circle says it, it's just a wave of denunciation, even worse in England, somewhat mixed on the continent. Uh, well, uh, you, the, I mean, you can understand the US position in a way. The US is gaining enormously from the war. Uh, Europe is being badly hit. Europe is harmed by the sanctions much more than Russia is. In fact, the whole uh, German-based industrial system, sophisticated, complicated system, which has been the core of uh, the most successful economic system in the world, has been the core of European development. It's now threatened, seriously, even threatened by possible deindustrialization. The, uh, the Europe is being hit quite hard uh, the Russia, of course, Ukraine is being devastated. U Russia is suffering severely, not so much economically, they have ways around it, but uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of casualties uh, 
the United States is degrading. Many commentators have pointed out that for the United States, it's a bargain at a small fraction of the military budget, they're able to degrade and destroy a large part of the military forces of their major military adversary in the world. That's a bargain. Uh, furthermore, geopolitically, uh, Putin's criminal invasion of Ukraine gave the United States a gift on a silver platter. It, it drove Europe into Washington's pocket. That's been an issue way back to 1945. One of the major issues in the Cold War all the way through has been whether Europe would move on an independent path, whether it would become a third force, as it was called in international affairs. Certainly Europe's capable of that. Enormous economy, sophisticated, advanced culture, advanced technology. Uh, uh, will they follow the policies of de Gaulle, Europe from the Atlantic to the Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's common European home from Lisbon to Vladivostok? It's always been a possibility. Putin killed it, at least temporarily, by driving Europe into Washington's pocket. It's a wonderful gift to the United States in the short term, at least, as long as Europe is willing to suffer the effects of hanging on to Washington's coattails. May not, it's a bitter fate. Of course, for the rest of the world, it's even worse. Almost the entire world is calling for negotiations and diplomacy. India, Indonesia, Brazil, now under the new government, uh, the entire global south, uh, the United States and Britain, the traditional warrior states, they're pressing to continue the war. In fact, official US policy remains to fight the war to severely weaken Russia, their adversary on the international scene. So here's a chance to severely weaken Russia at quite a cost to Ukraine and much of the rest of the world and possible escalation of the terminal war, but it's considered a good bargain so far. And we have, uh, since the United States is, uh, uh, doesn't, is not considering diplomacy and negotiations. The media do not cover these issues. They loyally keep to state policy. So we really don't know a great deal about the prospects for negotiations. But a good deal of material has leaked out, partly from Ukrainian sources, partly from others. Most recently, a couple of days ago from Israel, where former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett uh, described his efforts to mediate, which were stopped by the United States. Uh, we know that we have pretty good evidence that last March there were negotiations underway under Turkish auspices. Uh, we know that British part then Prime Minister Boris Johnson flew to Kiev and uh, inform the Ukrainians that the US and Britain are not in favor of this. It was followed by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, who presumably gave his standard message that the war must continue to weaken Russia. Anyway, the negotiations collapsed. We, since there's almost no coverage, we don't know much about the reasons, uh, but this has been repeatedly possible. Maybe you now, as Bennett said, uh, the only way to find out is to try. Can't can't learn anything about it unless you try. Well, mm -hmm. there are pressures all over the world to try, whether the United and also within Europe because they are suffering. Uh, but uh, the United States and Britain so far are pretty adamant. 
except for the military, like General Milley. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's about all we know at the present. Well, I was I was curious how we can how we can understand uh, the role of the media because uh, um, obviously we we will be censored most of the Russian media, but also in this well in, across the West, there's no uh, discussion about the background of the conflict. There's no there's there's no discussion about how to end the conflict, and as you pointed out uh, as well, it's already proven that. Uh, that uh, a lot of NATO countries sabotaged the Minsk agreement for seven years. And after Russia invaded, uh, the Israelis attempted to negotiate, as you said, and they've already confirmed that the West uh, essentially sabotaged this and prevented it. And then the Turks were going to uh, negotiate the peace. And now the foreign minister of Turkey has also said that the West uh, sabotaged it because they wanted to fight Russia some more. But th these are now, in my opinion, established facts. It's how how can we explain the Western media coverage? Because uh, this th th these facts never occur in the media. Instead, we're always told this was unprovoked and we only want to help Ukraine by giving it weapons. Uh, as an expert on propaganda, do you see this as a propaganda or is it something else? That term unprovoked is quite interesting. If you do, uh, the term unprovoked aggression has never been used in the past, almost never. In the case of Ukraine, every reference to the Russian invasion has to be called the unprovoked Russian invasion. Take a look, do a Google search for unprovoked invasion. You get a couple of million hits for unprovoked invasion of Ira of Ukraine. Try to find unprovoked invasion of Iraq. Maybe 10 people who wrote a letter to the Washington Post sometime. In fact, it's never been used before. And any psychologist can explain exactly what's going on. The reason for insisting on calling it the unprovoked invasion is you know perfectly well that it was provoked. In fact, there are extensive provocations going back to the 1990s. As I said, that's not my opinion. It's the opinion of almost the whole top level of the US diplomatic uh, echelon. Uh, anybody with eyes open can see it. And it's hawks, doves, everyone who knows anything about it. Of course, it was provoked. Provoked doesn't mean justified, that's separate, but it's obviously provoked. On the other hand, the US invasion of Iraq, which was much worse than the Russian invasion of Ukraine, though you're not allowed to say that, it was completely unprovoked. There was no provocation for the US-British invasion of Iraq. There's plenty of provocation for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They are both cases of criminal aggression. That's independent of the provocation. But it's very interesting, tells you a lot about propaganda to see the way the phrase unprovoked invasion has been become not only popular, but almost essential in the last uh, year or two. You have to call it that, even though everyone knows it's total nonsense. It's a way of trying to emphasize, try to get people not to pay attention to what's obvious. In fact, the propaganda on this is quite sophisticated. Let's take another example. Uh, take the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. It's been, it was immediately blamed on the Russians, which is almost inconceivable. Now why on earth should the Russians sabotage um, their own major capital investment? And for what possible purpose? I mean, if they wanted to stop uh, gas from flowing to Europe, all they have to do is turn a lever. They don't have to destroy their main capital investment. So the idea was crazy in the first place. Uh, if you ask which country had the capability and the motivation to destroy the pipeline, it's immediately obvious. The United States wasn't a secret even. They kept saying, we have to stop this pipeline. Uh, President Biden said, uh, we're going to prevent it, you know. 
uh, nobody else, maybe Poland working for the United States, but nobody else had, but you just cannot say this. And it's interesting the way it's handled. I wrote an article about it recently. There was a spate of articles in the press a couple of weeks ago saying there's now some skepticism about whether Russia sabotaged the pipeline. That's brilliant propaganda. The idea that Russia sabotaged the pipeline is outlandish. But we now establish the assumption, the presupposition that Russia was responsible, not us. We don't even talk about that. But to show how free and open we are, we even allow some skepticism about this idiotic idea. That's sophisticated propaganda, not trivial. Uh, uh, I presume that most of the world is laughing and ridicule about this, because who else could have sabotaged the pipeline, you know? But it's a very impressive propaganda exercise. Let's put the blame on the Russians. It's a technique that's uh, sometimes called the thief-thief technique. If you're caught with your hand in somebody's pocket, don't deny that a robbery is taking place because it's too obvious. Uh, point somewhere else and say, thief, thief, and maybe everybody will run over there and not notice that you have your hand in his pocket. It's a pretty standard propaganda technique and it's being used very brilliantly now, as in the case I just mentioned. Uh, today, as you may have noticed, Seymour Hersh came out with a long uh, investigation of the sabotage of the pipeline, giving a lot of details about what should have been understood to be obvious in the first place, and most of the world did understand to be obvious. Uh, he'll be silenced and vilified, you can be sure of that, but uh, called an uh, anti-American uh, Putin lover, you know, one of the other uh, uh, techniques of demonization. But uh, the point is pretty simple, and I think most of the world understands this very well. Uh, same about the, uh, the war. Very few countries are willing to participate in the US-British-led campaign. Uh, almost nobody supports the sanctions, except the United States and Britain, and uh, of course Europe, because they follow along, but almost nobody else. Uh, India, not India, not Indonesia, not uh, now Brazil, uh, almost nothing in the global south. I should say, if you talk about propaganda, India is an interesting example. Uh, you may recall that a couple of months ago, there was a lot of euphoria in the Western press, US, British press, about the fact, the idea that India was now separating itself from uh, Russia and criticizing the Russian uh, invasion. It was based on six words of Prime Minister Modi at, in a meeting between him and Putin in Samarkand. Uh, the six words were something like, uh, uh, War is not the answer, we should move towards peace. Okay, great excitement. India's uh, breaking from Russia. Take two minutes on the internet and look up the Indian government official website where you get Modi's speech. It's a love letter to Putin. He starts by saying, war is not the answer, we need peace, but our relations are closer than ever. We're going to work together to lead to a much better world and on and on. All of that was cut out in the Western commentary. Just the first six words falsified. It can't be by accident. Nobody's, I mean, this is just moderately sophisticated propaganda assuming that nobody's going to take the trouble to look up the Indian government website. No journalists, nobody, nobody else. Professor Chomsky, when one talks about 
propaganda. When you talk about the examples you've just cited, that would suggest an element of control of what the media publishes. Now, I, I can't help but feel that that's taking us a step beyond what we had previously when the media consented to do what it was doing. Now it looks as if, from what you say, it might be beyond that, that there's some degree of direction of what it says. See if I understood. Stronger than in the past? No. It's weaker than in the past. And the reason, if you go back to the 1960s, 1970s, 80s, it was much worse, incomparably worse. I've written thousands of pages about this. It's actually better now. And the reason it's better is because the activism of the 1960s and its aftermath did have a civilizing effect on the United States and other countries. That's why it's called the time of troubles, terrible time, because it civilized the societies. That's very dangerous. A lot of the journalists who are now writing have that background. They came out of that experience. Their minds were somewhat open. So there's more, somewhat more critical discussion now than there was in the years in the, in the past, even in the mainstream. It's pretty bad now, but we forget how incredibly awful it was then. Now, I mean, take the Vietnam War. We're now coming to the, it's the worst crime after the Second World War. There's nothing to compare with it. Uh, three, pure aggression, three countries destroyed, millions of people killed vast devastation, people still dying from chemical weapons. There's just nothing to compare with it. To this day, in the mainstream in the United States, you cannot call it a crime of aggression. All you can say is it was a mistake. We didn't use our power wide wisely. Our, at the left end of the spectrum, our bungling efforts to do good didn't work. In fact, the war is framed. You'll see this on the anniversary when there will be a lot of discussion. The war is framed as a war of defense of South Vietnam against North Vietnamese aggression. That's about 100% of commentary and scholarship. It was a war against South Vietnam. South Vietnam was the main target of the war all the way through. South Vietnamese resistance was what we called the Viet Cong here, was virtually decimated along with much of the civilian society. And there was a pretty harsh attack against North Vietnam, but that was on the side. Uh, it was trying to prevent North Vietnam from helping protect uh, the South Vietnamese from U.S. aggression. Try to say this, but nobody will even know what you're talking about. I mean, it's just not English. It's some Martian or something. I mean, it's exactly what happened. The documentation, the history is just overwhelming. There's no question about it, but it's inexpressible. Uh, now the Iraq war, we're now coming to the 20th anniversary. We'll hear the same. I mean, that's only 20 years, but it's the same. The, word, the most critical comment you can make about the Iraq war is it was a mistake. Uh, it was uh, an effort to, yesterday in the New York Times, it was an effort to protect Iraq and the world from a uh, mad dictator, uh, but it didn't work. It's ridiculous. Yes, Saddam was uh, 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 had carried out criminal acts, but it's necessary to suppress the unpleasant fact that Saddam's worst crimes were carried out with strong U.S. support. His worst crimes were in the 1980s. Chemical warfare, Alabja, all the things he's condemned for. 
the United States strongly supported them. Go back and take a look. It wasn't secret. Uh, in fact, even after all of this, the first President Bush uh, invited Saddam to send nuclear engineers to the United States for advanced training and weapons production. That was after his worst crimes off the record. Uh, there's no, in the newspaper today, you can read articles blaming Putin for the Malaysian airliner. Probably tomorrow they'll blame him for the Turkish Syrian earthquake. But whatever the truth of this, is it the first time an airliner's been blown up? What about the USS Vincent, which attacked a, an Iranian commercial airliner in commercial airspace? No ambiguity, shot it down, killed 290 people, went back to its base in Virginia, where it was celebrated, uh, given a uh, medal. The commander and the flight officer who shot it down were given medals of honor. Uh, President Bush said, I will never apologize for the United States. What about that? What happened to that? It was a pretty serious incident, Con quite apart from the atrocity. It convinced Iran that there's no hope of their prevailing in the Iraq-Iran war. Iraq invaded Iran with U.S. support, uh, murderous, hundreds of thousands of killed with chemical weapons, all supported by the United States. The shooting down of the airliner made it perfectly clear to Khomeini that we just can't fight this war. We can't fight the United States. And they uh, settled for, for what amounted to a surrender. It was an important event. Can you discuss it? It's impossible. If you try to talk about it, even elementary facts, uh, people, again, they think you're just talking some foreign language. This is, it's not our language. I mean, the, uh, but this, uh, to get back to your question, this is a lot better than the 1960s and 70s and 80s, much better. At least there's some arenas in which you can discuss it. And you even find uh, uh, critical voices breaking through occasionally in the mainstream media. There are now columnists in the New York Times, like Jamel Bowie, who you couldn't imagine there uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So it's bad, but it's better. Uh, do you think there's, uh, at some point, uh, there will be uh... A diplomatic settlement of this uh, war in Ukraine? And if so, uh, would, could this entail any security guarantees for Russia? Now, I ask because we, we well, speaking of propaganda, we always use this word that we're helping the Ukrainians. But, you know, we said we helped the Ukrainians when we pushed NATO on a population where, you know, less than 20% wanted to be a part of NATO. Uh, we said we helped Ukraine when we toppled the government and <laughs> replaced it with one picked by the U.S. And we said that we, you know, helped Ukraine when uh, when we sabotaged the peace agreements. And now we're helping Ukraine in this war of attrition by pumping in weapons. Uh, it just uh, seems help always appears to put Ukraine on a path uh, uh, to confrontation with Russia, uh, as opposed to you know giving Russia security guarantees. Um, so, you know, Russians can feel safe and thus take a step back from Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's my question. How how do you think it's possible that the West will at some point grant these security guarantees to Russia uh, in some future peace agreement in terms of uh, not having any more NATO expansion? The basic terms of a peace agreement have always been obvious. It's basically what was formulated in uh, the Minsk II agreements, the Normandy initiatives by France and Germany. It's kind of interesting that Merkel and Hollande are now claiming that this was a fraud, that they never intended it, that they were just giving time to Ukraine to rearm. That's not credible. 
they're almost certainly lying. There is no evidence in the documentary or historical record to show that they were not taking it seriously. I think both of them are now trying to cover up and not be accused of being Putin lovers, the ultimate crime in the West. But the fact is that the Minsk proposals are pretty much along the lines of what you suggested. Ukraine should be neutralized, should have a status like Mexico or like uh, Austria during the Cold War, no infringement on sovereignty, but neutralized. And with regard to the Donbass region, the Minsk proposals would, were that they should be incorporated within Ukraine, but given substantial autonomy. Now, whether that's still a question of Crimea is uh, off, off the discussion for the moment. Actually, as recently as last March, uh, Zelensky made similar proposals. Uh, it's not unimaginable. I mean, now they reject it, but uh, that's recent. As the war escalates, positions harden, naturally. That's part of the natural dynamic. But uh, is it possible to move towards something like that? Yes. Uh, there will have to be security guarantees for Ukraine. Now that can be given out. I mean, first of all, I don't even think they're necessary, but if you think they're necessary, they can be given. Uh, the West can make strong commitments to protect Ukraine against any future Russian aggression if it is neutralized. And there's no reason to expect any Russian aggression after that. Uh, you have to take a look at uh, uh, Western propaganda on this issue here too. It's quite interesting to take a look at uh, Sweden and Finland, which is an interesting case. Now applied for membership in NATO. Uh, there's a concept that uh, George Orwell defined. He called it double think. It's the ability to have two ideas in mind which are completely contradictory and to believe both of them. And he thought it was a property of totalitarian states. It was wrong, standard in the West. Uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, most of the West are perfect examples of this. On the one hand, they're gloating over the demonstration of Russian military incompetence. They weren't even able to conquer towns 20 kilometers from the border, defended by a mostly citizen's army, it shows that our belief that they had a strong military was completely wrong, it's corrupt, and they don't know what they're doing, and so on. It's wonderful. Look how weak they are. That's one idea. The other idea is they're about to conquer the West. We're just on the verge of destruction from uh, the uh, a Russian monster which is about to conquer everything. Well, that's Sweden and Finland. Swedish, I mean, I've had talks in Sweden and Finland, strategic analysts and other uh, people with their brains functioning know that there isn't the slightest threat, remotest threat from Russia to either Sweden or Finland, not even remote. It's never been hinted at and there's no capability of it. But they also know something else. Sweden and Finland have already been pretty much integrated into NATO, not formally, but in practice, uh, joint military operations and so on. If they join NATO, it's a wonderful opportunity for the adva quite advanced military systems of Sweden and Finland. They'll have new markets, they'll have interoperability of technology, great for their military industry. So let's join NATO on the pretense that Peter the Great is coming to destroy us. This is pretty effective propaganda. And in fact, a lot of the population probably believes it. It's kind of interesting to notice that how desperate Western propaganda is to find some indication of Russian 
intentions to do what they are totally incapable of doing. So if Putin makes a speech in which he mentions Peter the Great, a uh, whole bunch of columns immediately appear. Look, he's saying he wants to conquer the West. We've got to have a bigger military. I mean, actually, France and Germany outspend Russia in military expenditures, let alone the United States and Britain. Uh, but uh, this goes way back. You can go back to the early days of the Cold War, uh, when uh, 1950, 51, when the United States was concocting some image of uh, what they call the Kremlin slave state, which is by its very nature inherent, has to extend its domination over the entire world. It's part of its intrinsic nature. There's nothing you can do about it. So we have to have a huge military to overcome it. Uh, when Stalin offered in 1952 to allow a unified Germany uh, with one condition, not join a hostile military alliance. It was supported by people like George Cannon, but the mainstream just silenced it, denounced it, ridiculed it. We don't want this. We want the Kremlin conspiracy to conquer the world. That way we can build up a huge rearmament program uh, uh, stimulate our economies, uh, overcome the so-called dollar gap, the inability of Europe to purchase U.S. Uh, uh, exports. Uh, that's what lies behind it. But we have to have this Russian demon conquering the world. Now it's a Chinese demon. We have to surround China with military bases, uh, 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 encircle them, uh, go to war to pretend, to pretend to prevent China from developing uh, economically because otherwise they're going to conquer us. I mean, it, it's just goes, you can carry it back to the Declaration of Independence if you like. Read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, one of the condemnations of King George III, I'm quoting, he unleashed against us the merciless Indian savages. Is that what happened? It was the merciless English savages who were attacking the native population. But no, we were innocent, uh, just living in peace. And suddenly these merciless Indian savages attacked us on the command of George III. Everyone intones that piously every July 4th, it's only 250 years, you know. And we're breaking no new ground. Britain was exactly the same. France was exactly the same when they were the dominant imperial powers. All imperial powers are angelic, under attack by barbarians. Uh, that's just standard fare. U.S. just picking it up from the standard imperial history. Well, yeah, you, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, yeah, you mentioned China. And uh, of course, the United States has two key adversaries now, which is both uh, yeah, Moscow and Beijing. Um, the, the, the objectives towards Russia seems kind of clear. It's been the same uh, for quite some time. But uh, uh, what are the objectives towards China? Um, uh, what, uh, what what does the United States uh, seek to obtain? Uh, uh, given it, it appears that over the past few years, uh, the United States has been chipping away at this one China policy by you know sending military advisor, kind of slowly scrapping away any pretense of uh, it being part of China. Um, do you see a like likelihood of a war between the U.S. and the Chinese in the coming years? There's a lot of talk about that. One high U.S. military official just a couple of days ago saying he predicts a war with China by 2025. This is pure insanity. You can't have a war with an advanced nuclear state. It's termination. It's the end of the 
story. It's out of the question. Uh, what's the problem with China? Well, actually, the former prime minister of Australia, Paul Keating, right in the dragon's claws, had an article in the Australian press recently in which he ran through the China threat, one claim after another, pretty easily debunked. He finally drew the obvious conclusion. The threat of China is China is there and it refuses to follow US orders. It's not like Europe. US tells Europe, you're not allowed to trade with Iran. Europe doesn't like it, but it follows the orders. US tells China, you're not allowed to trade with Iran. You don't pay any attention. Can't have that. You can't have a major country that doesn't follow orders. That's an intolerable threat. Uh, international affairs is pretty much like the mafia. Uh, the godfather does not accept disobe disobedience. It's too dangerous. Even disobedience from a small shopkeeper is dangerous because others may follow the example. But a major disobedience like another, someone else trying to be the godfather, can't have that. And that's pretty much the basic principle of international affairs. As I say, US didn't invent it. It's just taking it over from imperial history. China's threat is, there are lots of things China's doing that are wrong, even violation of international law, but that's not a threat. The threat is simply, they are there, they do not follow orders, they follow their own path, the developing much of Eurasia through the Belt and Road Initiative. This is expanding to uh, Southeast Asia, to Africa, to Latin America even. That's intolerable. Well, can't stop it with bombs, so let's try to stop it some other way by preventing their economic development. Uh, it's a long story, but it's very dangerous. Yeah, Noam Chomsky, thank you very much for taking this time. Uh, we do appreciate it. Thank you indeed. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much.